16 to order. I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll. Helen. Augur. Barrio. I like here. Castro. And we'll stuff going on. She's here. She's here. She's here. Shaw. Here. Davis. Here. Cross. Here. Gillum. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. I'd like to ask Assistant Finance Director Erica Wagner, who's joined by her husband and her son today, uh, to come to the microphone to lead, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, later on in the agenda, the county will be receiving an award, and Erica was instrumental in the county receiving that award. And if you'll remain standing after the pledge, uh, we'll have the prayer from there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you would remain standing, I'd like to ask Ms. Karen Hill, Director of the Major Planned Gifts for Living Well Cancer Resource Center, to come to the podium to lead us in prayer. Uh, I've asked Karen if she would take just a moment uh, to tell us about the good work that Living Well does uh, at Northwestern Del Nor Hospital. So Karen. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Living Well, as many of you know, provides psychosocial support for people who are going through cancer treatment, as well as their family members. And it's for all free services to anyone, no matter where they're getting their cancer treatments. Um, and it's all provided by the generosity of the community, uh, including the Kane County Grand Victoria Rebuilt Fund. So I appreciate all the support um, that brings hope to so many families that, as they face cancer in their lives. If you know anyone that is recently diagnosed with cancer, please tell them about Living Well. We're right up the road. And let us now bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day, for the sunshine that you give us and rain. We thank you for this country of ours, the freedom that we have that so many around the world are not able to have. We thank you for this community of Kane County. We ask your blessing over all those in our world who grieve today, especially those who have lost loved ones in recent days. And we ask your blessing over those in our community here in Kane County who are lonely or hungry or are sick, and in a special way those with cancer and their family members. And we ask you to help them know the support that all here provide. We ask your blessing over our leaders in our world and in our country, and especially those here in this room. Grant them your wisdom and your justice and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Thank you. Approval of the minutes. Uh, may I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from May 10th, 2016 meeting? So moved by Ms. Starrett, second by Mr. Leonard. Are there any thoughts, comments, or changes? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Uh, motion passes. The minutes are approved. Uh, under new and unfinished business presentations discussion, we have the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award that's going to be. Uh, presented today by Rita Cruz, Illinois Government Finance Officers Association. I'd like to ask Ms. Rita Cruz from uh, that organization, along with Finance Committee Chairman John Hoshite, uh, as well as Finance Executive Director Joe Onsick and Assistant Finance Director Erica Wagner to come forward for the presentation. If you'll come over to here, I think that everybody will be able to see you. Uh, do 
we have do we have a handheld microphone? <clears throat> We go. Well, okay. <laughs> On behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada, I am honored to have been invited here today to present the Finance Department of King County the GFOA Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. This award represents a significant achievement by your organization. It indicates that your document has been reviewed and rated by favorable by a expert panel of independent budgeting professionals. In order to receive this award, the Finance Department had to satisfy nationally recognized guidelines for effective budget presentation. These guidelines were designed to assess how well the budget document fulfills four major purposes. First, the budget document should serve as a policy tool. Second, the budget should present a clear financial plan. Third, the budget should be a guide for the organization's operations. Finally, the budget should serve as a communications medium providing summary information about the organization's programs, services, and finances in a manner suitable for the media and general public. Since the inception of the GFOA's Distinguished Budget Presentation Award in 1984, only 19% or approximately 900 entities out of more than 4,800 GFOA member units in the United States and Canada have received this award. On behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association, I applaud you and your efforts and ask that you continue your commitment to, an excellent, to excellence in, budget, in governmental budgeting. I would now like to present the award to Eric Wagner, Assistant Director of the King County Finance Department. Congratulations. I'd just like to thank Erica Wagner for her leadership in taking the initiative to strive for this award. This award is not only a reflection of the quality of the budget book, but more importantly of the budget process itself. And so I hope that this achievement will instill a greater sense of pride and confidence in our work together as a county to develop our annual budget. I know Erica has a long speech, so I'll make this brief. Uh, <laughs> uh, just on behalf of the county board, I want to thank Erica for her hard work and Joe as well. Uh, you know, the, um, from a board's perspective, transparency and, and making available to the public our financial information is critical. And uh, obviously, to get this award, only a small percentage of the uh, governmental agencies are, are able to obtain the award. So that's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of work. Uh, as I've always said before, I get emails from the finance department all hours, 24-7, you know, 9 o'clock at night. Erica sends me a request to approve the uh, agenda for the next finance committee meeting. So there's a lot of hard work that went into this, and I just want to say from the board's perspective, we really appreciate it. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, this award is really a representation of all the hard work of everybody in my department, especially. I can't take all of the credit for it. Um, and everybody who really helps us put that document together. Um, we couldn't get the information we need without the cooperation of everybody in the county and the county board. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, and thank you to every one of the board members here uh, who support the effort of transparency and uh, the resources that are necessary to uh, have that information provided to the board for your decisions. Now, this morning, I, um, I'd like to, um, my 
program, the short program this morning, is going to be about eight to ten minutes, and it includes a video. Um, but today's chairman's program is about communicating an accurate record of our work on behalf of, and I'll hold on on the slides until uh, I'll get to that point. Uh, uh, it's a program, the program is about communicating an accurate record of our work on behalf of 532,000 constituents. The majority of this board is doing its best to strengthen the trust and confidence in public institutions, in our specific case, uh, Kane County government. We emphasize transparency, professionalism, and following the law. Uh, you probably agree with me that uh, these days are probably not American politics' finest hour, uh, and so everybody, it is really important that all of us do our share uh, to reverse them, try to restore the trust and confidence. It does take everybody's, uh, everyone's best effort to accomplish this. Board members first, countywide elected officials, department directors, and every single frontline staff member. These are the obvious partners but there are more. Our independent contractors, outside advisors, and very importantly, the press. It's imperative that each of our partners uh, plays their role properly and with honest confidence. If they don't, all of us lose credibility and the trust of those for whom we work. It's tragic that these days it seems that those people who play by the rules live at a disadvantage. There's cheating on school exams. There's performance enhancing doping in sports competitions. If any one of us doesn't make our mortgage payments or our car payment, the bank comes and forecloses or repossesses our property. Yet when big banks screw up, they get bailed out. It's not right, not how any of us think that it should be. So we have to try harder and be more disciplined. You know, I coached my oldest son, Ted, the Marine Corps pilot officer, when he was six or seven years old in soccer. He came off the field in one game with real disbelief and confusion on his face and in his voice, and he goes, Dad, Dad, they're cheating out there. And it kind of surprised me, but I thought about it, and I sent him back into the game saying, um, you'll just have to run faster and try harder. What else can any of us do? So it's a good thing that we hold each other accountable for our decisions and our behavior. I'm grateful to Gloria Casas uh, at the Tribune, representing the Aurora Beacon News and Elgin Courier in um, uh, King County, uh, and also Ashley Sloboda at the Chronicle for their accurate reporting. They check their facts and leave opinions for the editorial page. However, with all due respect, and with no malice or rancor or sarcasm or hostility, there seems to be a pattern. Uh, examples from just this month's work, if you uh, put that slide up. Uh, at the Daily Herald and Jim Fuller uh, articles of skewing the news and then spinning it. Um, you know, I've tried one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, working with Jim uh, over a two-year period of time. Um, uh, then tried to ignore it in a year and a half. Uh, now I simply want to correct impressions as respectfully as possible. Less spin and opinions on editorial pages. It's awfully easy just to criticize, especially when no one talks back to you. If folks want to set policy, then they should do what 24 board members have done and put themselves and their families on the line by running for office. Frankly, it's just that simple. Uh, here are, there are five examples, uh, four on this page. Uh, on uh, May 11th, um, King County residents, get ready to pay to recycle your own TV. Now the people who are here for those meetings understand that Phil Lewis, in his legitimate role as a board member that he's earned through election, um, uh, he was the one vote and a motion uh, to use taxpayer money, uh, money to collect uh, TVs uh, for, and to dump them. There was not a second and not uh, one single supporting vote out of the remaining 23, which means that 23 out of 24 board members representing 530,000 uh, people, it's not get ready to pay for recycling old TVs, it's we're going to save your tax money. We're not going to have people uh, uh, 
spending money to uh, collect uh, other people's throwouts. Second example, the county board put local taxpayers on the hook for funding child support enforcement efforts by the state's attorney's office. That was May 13th. You know, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of the uh, board, uh, this is an odd way of putting such an important program priority support uh, from the board. Putting local taxpayers on the hook. We spend approximately $250 million that we're entrusted with each year, and uh, it's not a matter of putting them on the hook. That is a way of driving a wedge between the people who are elected to serve and I think do a, a good job of serving and the people who we serve. Uh, number three, liquor license battle for uh, Hideaway likely headed to court. The arguments both for and against were almost all recycled comments from the zoning petition battle involving the business last fall. Uh, again, May 19th, uh, Jim Fuller article. Uh, headed to court is a speculation, may be true, may not be true. Uh, I hope it's not encouragement for anybody to sue the county. That's about the last thing that any of us would want. The idea that these are recycled comments from the zoning petition battle, uh, all the people who serve on the Liquor Commission understand that it is not recycled uh, uh, information. It's very specifically health and safety. We have been very deliberate and careful uh, to focus all of our uh, thoughts and comments in that area. Then finally, the fourth one I recognize, this is totally optional. Uh, but I was very grateful for Gloria Casas in uh, the, the article that appeared about the 2016 Leaders Summit coverage. Uh, it was wonderful, it was very factual, and it was uplifting. Now, I know that this is good news, but it was interesting that that uh, that was the uh, in the Daily Herald. That good news wasn't covered. Uh, we had 249 uh, leaders in our community who gathered uh, for an entire Friday morning, uh, and we brought uh, Tony Preckwinkle from uh, Cook County to address uh, the group. So it was very productive, uh, and I'm very grateful to the uh, Chronicle and to the uh, Beacon and Courier. Uh, for covering good news, as well as some of the more difficult things that we struggle with. You know, what we talk about here almost always stays here. You know, it's really important to the 24 people and the members who take the time from the audience to come. Uh, but it's really important how your work is reported to 532,000 people. Uh, so we rely on the press to accurately report. Uh, would you put up the uh, second slide? Um, uh, the final uh, item, and I have just a short video that uh, describes uh, why, uh, unfortunately, the quote in the May 25th, 2016 um, uh, Daily Herald, it's just wrong. It's inaccurate. And the importance of checking facts is important. So uh, it's not true, and I think that Kurt Kozark and um, uh, Mark Armstrong uh, explained it about as clearly as I've heard it explained, but it's not true that as a result of freezing a property tax levy, including not the new growth, the result is not that people who built new homes during the freeze are shouldering less of a tax burden than neighbors with older property. Would you put on the video? Mark Armstrong, and go ahead and work and we'll start and I'll stop when it's, when Mark starts talking. Uh, Mark has been gone for a while. I'm Mark Armstrong, and I'm here to answer a question about the Cuban County property tax freeze now in its fifth year. The taxpayer writes, I read online that people who built new homes during the freeze are shouldering less of a tax burden the neighbors with older property. Is that true? I'm happy to say that is not true. People who have new homes are not paying less in tax burden than those who have existing homes of comparable value. I'll show you why. Let's start by looking at what new property actually is. New property is defined under the property tax code as either new buildings, additions to existing buildings, the incremental value in expiring TIF districts, 
or exempt property from the prior year, which has now been placed on the tax rolls. Well, last year, that added up to about $100 million worth of value. So how does that affect property tax rates and tax burdens? Well, let's start with our property tax exemption. Now, this example shows what happens if the property tax freeze is maintained. That means we're not going to extend any more property taxes on the Kane County homeowners than in prior years. And for a number of years, that's been held at $53.89 million. Now, the next step in the calculation is to look at rate setting equalized assessed value. The rate setting value of property is the assessed value of property minus homestead exemptions. Now, before new property was added in last year, we had $11.9 billion of equalized assessed value. After that was added in, we a little more than $12 billion. Now, the next step is to establish a property tax rate. Now, if there had been no new property, that would be simply dividing the extension by the equalized assessed value, and that would have given us a rate a little more than 0.45%. But after adding in that 100 million of equalized assessed value, that actually lowered the tax rate to a little below 0.45%. That means that if there had been no new property in the 2015 taxable year, the owner of a $250,000 home that he lived in would be paying about $350 a year in Kane County property taxes to the county government. But because the freeze was maintained and that new property was added in, that lowered a little bit to about $346. Now that is applied equally whether a home is new or old. The age of the home is not going to make a difference in the tax rate. So a $250,000 house that is 10 years old, 20 years old, or 100 years old is going to be paying exactly the same tax burden as a brand new house with that same value. But one question I get is, why is that so? Why do new properties get taxed the same as old? Well, it's constitutional in Illinois. The only Constitution says that taxes have to be levied uniformly by valuation. There is no difference for age. But what if we didn't maintain the tax freeze? How would that actually work? Well, if we decided, for instance, to say, extend additional taxes to account for new property, the math would look something like this. We'd have to start with what that rate would be without new property. Now this is going to be brought forward from our old example. So we have $53.8 million of tax levy, $11.9 billion of rate setting EAV, and that gives us a tax rate of a little over 0.45%. Now if there was tax going to be levied at that same rate with the new property added, what happens is that rate stays the same, but it's then applied to a higher equalized assessed value, and that gives us a total property tax extension of $54.48 million. Now that would mean instead of dropping everyone's taxes, it means everyone's taxes would remain the same, but that remaining the same would apply whether it's an old house or a new house. Whether the freeze continues or not, there is no impact to the respective tax burden of new homes as compared to older homes. I'm Mark Armstrong. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm Mark Armstrong. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that this explanation is also useful over the next four to five months as the board is considering uh, what we're going to do with our tax policy uh, especially about the freeze. Uh, again, this, this uh, portion of the program today, my intention is constructive, uh, and I just, uh, what we do is very important. The credibility and the trust uh, that uh, constituents have in public institutions uh, is constantly being damaged. What we're trying to do as a group, all of us together, uh, is to improve on that situation. 
Uh, next on the agenda is uh, speakers on agenda items. We don't have any speakers uh, f uh, today for agenda items. However, we have a speaker for non-agenda items toward the end of the program. Uh, zoning commissions, I'd like to ask Development Committee Chairman Kirk Kozarek to discuss and make a motion to approve zoning petition 4375. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, zoning petition 4375 is located in Elgin Township. The petitioner, Ronald Schombeck Trust, is uh, looking to rezone an F district farming to an R3 District 1 family residential. Um, the zoning board approved. The development committee um, approved. I'll make the motion to approve today. So moved by Mr. Kozarek, second by uh, Mr. Dahl. Uh, are there, is there any discussion? If not, if there are no questions, I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll. Yes. Castro. Yes. Saul. Yes. Davis. Yes. Ross. Yes. Gillum. Yes. Amen. Yes. Poche. Yes. Ishmael. Yes. Kenyon. Yes. Cesar. Yes. Leonard. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Martha. Yes. Molina. Yes. Pollock. Yes. Sheffield. Yes. Silva. Yes. Smith. Yes. Sterrett. Aye. Vance Yes. Yes. Okay. The motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Kozark. Uh, on resolutions and ordinances, would anyone like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Uh, Ms. Allen? Uh, I'd like to remove 16-170. Okay. Any others? Okay. If not, uh, I'd like to ask for a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of 16-170. So moved by Ms. Sterrett, second by Mr. Ishmael. Um, So we have a motion and a second. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Ellen? Aye. Auburn? Yes. Burial? Yes. Castro? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Davis? Yes. Fry? Yes. Gillum? Yes. Heyman? Yes. O'Shea? Yes. Ishmael? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Kazarik? Yes. Leonard? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Martin? Yes. Molina? Yes. Hollis? Yes. Sheffield? Yes. Silva? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sterrett? Yes. Vasquez? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Uh, now on uh, number 16-170, I may have a motion and a second uh, to pass that and discuss it. So Ms. Allen, second by Ms. Starrett. Ms. Allen. I just wanted to pull this off the agenda. Um, our drug court is a chance for people to leave drugs and alcohol behind them and restart their lives and it's an expensive program because it saves lives one at a time but it also saves the families of those people and their communities and we put a bunch of our riverboat money and our general fund money into that program um, it was I think forcibly brought into creation by uh, retired judge James Doyle um, new ideas are not always rigid, are not always uh, grasped to the heart right away. But one of the things that I noticed when I went to the graduations from those courts was that the people who succeeded getting through those programs, and sometimes they were people who said, this is a two-year program and it's taken me five years to get through it. Um, but those people not only took their certificate of graduation, but also hugged the judge and the staff members. Um, people are grateful for a chance to live their lives again. Um, then Judge uh, Doyle was uh, followed uh, by a stint by uh, Judge Patricia Piper Golden. She is still running the um, alumni program so that if uh, you, you may have succeeded in, in surviving the program and gotten your certificate, but the fact is that everybody needs support. And fortunately, a lot of people who have done drug court are willing to mentor people who are going through the process now, uh, proof that it works and you can make it. And then currently, uh, Judge Mamari Kasoni is, is running that program. I recently attended, along with several other board members, uh, a graduation. And um, they're back to hugging. <laughs> the people who uh, finished that program are just, um, it's just, uh, 
It's, it's a, a really lovely program. It's, it's apparently heartfelt all the way along. And uh, I wanted to mention that for, for those of us uh, uh, to know that we have a working program. And I pulled this off the agenda this morning because you'll notice that it has to do with contracts with Gateway Foundation, Lutheran Social Services, and Woodridge. And it just happens that a number of the graduates this last time mentioned that Gateway saved their lives. So just wanted to bring that into the, into the public forum and the record and say thanks for that good hard work. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Any other discussion, Mr. Heyman? Uh, I also wanted to add to that. It also saves us, I think, about five or six million dollars of taxpayers' money, <laughs> this program. Yes. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any other discussion? If not, we have a motion and a second to pass uh, Resolution 16170. Uh, clerk, call the roll. Allen? Aye. Hunter? Yes. Burial? Yes. Castro? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Devin? Yes. Frost? Yes. Gillum? Yes. Heyman? Yes. Bouchard? Yes. Ishmael? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Cazera? Yes. Leonard? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Martin? Yes. Molina? Yes. Holland? Yes. Sheffield? Yes. yes. Silva? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sterrett? Yes. Vesquez? Yes. Whitaker? Yes. Okay, motion passes. I may have a, a motion and a second uh, to discuss and potentially pass uh, Resolution 16191. Uh, motion is made by Mr. Pollock, second by Ms. Castro. <coughs> uh, and so, uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Fraz. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'll be voting no on this as I do each year, as you know, uh, to bring uh, light to the prevailing wage law uh, and bring it into public focus again. Uh, this is a 1930s era law that uh, requires taxpayers to pay a 15 to 25 percent premium on public projects as opposed to shopping the free market for the best vendor at the best price. 18 states, including several of our neighbors, either do not have this uh, prevailing wage law or have repealed it to become more efficient. Uh, this is a key component of Governor Honor's Illinois turnaround agenda, and I know the governor's office is working on some options for this. Uh, this law could be repealed in full. Uh, it could be, uh, uh, thresholds could be set higher so that smaller governmental agencies and smaller projects are not affected by it. Or it could simply be followed by determining a true local prevailing wage law. I understand it's not in this uh, body's uh, power to change state law, but I am voting no to bring it to light and public awareness uh, and promote, ongo promote ongoing review and debate uh, as this translates directly into high taxes at a time when we're trying to maintain our frozen tax levy and small uh, townships and smaller governments are having a hard time just providing basic services. It's a shame to uh, impose a 15 to 25 percent premium on projects that the public sector would not have to endure. So um, I know I'm not going get to get this uh, turned down. I know we do have to ultimately uh, uh, pass it, but I'm voting no just to bring it to light. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franz. Other discussion? Uh, Mr. Dahl? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be voting yes, and, and I will just uh, share to bring light a few facts. Uh, prevailing wage is a framework which labor markets operate to improve living standards and ensure that economic development is broadly shared. It reduces downward pressure on construction wage and benefits which result from a low bid system by reducing the downward pressure on compensation while retaining the low bid system. Prevailing wage laws incentivize construction contractors to compete on the basis of efficiency and productivity. A couple facts. Prevailing wages contribute to the local economy by the consumer spending of construction workers. If repealed or even lowered, it will bring an influx of out-of-state contractors to the region. If Illinois repealed its prevailing wage law, the anticipated total state and local tax impact would be 44.35 million loss in government revenue. The expected repeal would also lead to almost 115 million in lost federal tax revenue. In addition, prevailing wage laws increase veteran employment in blue collar construction, 
increased the annual incomes of veteran blue collar construction workers by 7.0 to 10, over 10%. 10 they increased employer provided health coverage for veterans in construction by 11.2 to 14.6% and support over 7,000 veteran owned construction firms. And if it repealed or lowered, possibly go out of business if the laws were uh, uh, appealed. I hear uh, you, usually the opposition will th throw out 15 to 20 percent increase in costs. There is not a true study that shows this. There are three studies that were uh, produced that were trying to show that you know uh, why prevailing wage increases costs. One of them is a 1989 study by the state of Maryland uh, Department of Fiscal Services where it, uh, it did a pool of 20 school projects. In that, though, uh, the study was found after years that the, that the Maryland study suffered from a small sample size and lack of controls. In 1994, there was a study on Davis-Bacon projects where it was saying that over 26 percent uh, more costly on average than private projects. This study, after years down the road, uh, signed the entire total cost increase to prevailing wage regulations failing to parse out the effects of being public sector projects, larger in size, serve different purposes, and require different material and input. There's another study in 2008, the Bacon Hill Institute for Public Policy Research, where wage determinations didn't truly reflect prevailing wages in local areas. Once again, it was found to have attributed supposedly mismeasured wage differences to unrepresentative surveys, which biased the researchers' estimates. Here's just some of the facts. Uh, I do have copies of, of three studies by professors, including the Pre Illinois Prevailing Wage Act, if anybody would need some. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dahl. Any further discussion? If not, the clerk, oh, excuse me, Ms. Allen? I just wanted to say that I'm intrigued by the idea of there being a local prevailing wage only because it makes sense that if you build something in the city of Chicago, it probably is going to cost more than to build something in the southern part of, of rural Illinois. But I, I want to say that uh, I will, of course, support this because this is how we build a middle class in this country. And one of the things that we're arguing about right now is how to try and shore up that middle class, um, uh, try and decide what a fair minimum wage is, um, how, to, how to keep our country going in the, um, in the way that the fathers seem to have in mind that we would. And that is, of course, we'll have rich people, of course, we'll have poor people, of course, we'll have people who are addicted to, gr to drugs. But most of us are somewhere in that middle. And we take our energy and our wealth to try and provide uh, some assistance for those of us who are not as well off as we are and who need our comfort and so on. So I'm happy to support this bill. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Further discussion uh, and, and on things that have not been said so far? Um, let's see, Ms. Castro and then Mr. Fraz for a second. Uh, Ms. Castro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be voting in favor of this. I, I think my colleagues have kind of summed up, but let, let's not forget, you know, the middle class, our, our friends in labor are, have always been a part of our community, our county. They've done a lot of good things, and we need to quit attacking the middle class as we are. As you can see, this discussion has now drifted to this, this body, and as you saw, it is continuing to stalemate what's going on in Springfield as of now. There is no progress because, I won't say names, but there is a particular individual that wants to attack this group. It is not part of the discussion. We need a state budget right now, and it is holding that budget hostage. These folks work hard, as Mr. Dahl has stated. There's many components that produce a project that doesn't include also delays for whatever particular reason. The cost of materials could go up. It's really easy to put the finger on labor, 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 labor. That's the reason why costs. Let's put it this way. Yes, Mr. Dahl, you are right. There are many communities around us and many states around us that don't have prevailing wage. And guess what? Those individuals drive into Illinois because we have good paying jobs. So um, I, I'm proud of that. And, and you know we have good paying jobs, and we should continue to have that. Because if we start eliminating these, 
these, you know, the prevailing wage and such start driving down, you know, um, you know, the hourly wage folks are, you're going to have more and more folks live in poverty. And, and that's not what we want. We need to quit eroding the middle class. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Mr. Fries? Oh, excuse me. Um, uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Dahl, and then, um, you know, we'll go around for seconds if Mr. Um, Mr. Pollack. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith first and then Mr. Pollack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it should be recognized that uh, no matter what we do today, it has no effect on the prevailing wage. This was a bill that was passed by the state legislature, and somehow they had it, they dumped it on, on the local municipalities and counties to vote on. But no matter what we do, we will still pre be pre paying prevailing wage. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Pollack? Thank you. I, I thank Mr. Dahl for bringing the numbers into this. Uh, those of us that are lawyers go to law school because we don't want to do math and see numbers, so I appreciate you doing that so we don't have to. But uh, as Ms. Castro said, you know, we don't want to make this into a war about this. We don't want to bring the politics into this. But what, what makes me happy is knowing that Illinois, and especially Kane County, have some of the best trained, best skilled employees around. That's why people want to be here. That's why our county's growing. That's why people want to come to this area. And that's something we should be proud of. And that's something that we want to maintain. And so we're not going to go that route. We're not going to attack anyone. Um, this is state law. I, I believe one of the comments I heard earlier was, this is the law. This, isn't, this shouldn't be a discussion. And I agree with that. If, if anyone has issues with it, obviously that's something we can take up with our state legislature. Clearly, this bill was passed by an overwhelming majority of Democrats and Republicans. It has bipartisan support. If you have issues with it, you know, feel free to bring it forward. Talk to your state legislators to change it. But at this point, that's not going to happen. Uh, the federal bill was passed by the Davis-Bacon Act that we keep talking about, passed by two Republicans. This is one of those areas where both parties agree that this is what the law should be. And all we're doing today is saying we're following the law. The law is very clear. The county has the responsibility to do it, and we're going to do that today. So I urge an I vote. Thank you, Mr. Pollack. Any other thoughts? If not, Mr. Frost. Just, just real briefly, and I would disagree that both parties agree to that. Um, I know some do, but uh, not all. Um, just some quick facts to, to kind of counter some other facts that were thrown out today. But 80 per, 86 percent of construction in the nation is done by non-union contractors, and they are well-paid members of the middle class and well-trained and work very safely. 6.4% uh, of the public sector are union members. So I believe this law supports the few at the cost of the many being the taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fries. Okay, clerk, call the roll. Allen? Robert? No. Larry? Yes. Castro? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Davis? Yes. Fries? No. Gillen. Yes. Heyman. Yes. O'Shea. Yes. Ishmael. Yes. Kenyon. Yes. Kozarek. Yes. Leonard. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Martin. Yes. Molina. <coughs> Pollock. Yes. Sheffield. No. Silva. Yes. Smith. No. Sheriff Sarah. No. Vesquez. Yes. Winicki. No. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding appointments, um, uh, I have been advised by Assistant State's Attorney Michelle Nerman uh, that there is an issue with the current composition of the Legal Affairs and uh, Claims Committee and that Section 2-193 of the County Code reads, uh, the Legal Affairs Claims Committee shall be a subcommittee of the County Board Executive Committee, shall consist of four members thereof appointed by the Chairman of the County Board with advice and consent of the County Board, and a Chairman who shall be the Chairman of the County Board. So I'd like to thank uh, Maggie Auger, John Martin, uh, Doug Shefflo, all who are lawyers uh, elected to this board for their service on that committee, uh, but we do need to follow our um, uh, ordinances and so may I have a motion and a second to approve the appointment of Kurt Kozarek uh, who's the development committee chair and Bill Leonard the human services committee chair to the legal affairs and claims committee so the motion is made by Mr. Hoshite second by 
Uh, Mr. Shefflow, uh, is there any discussion? If not, clerk, call the roll. Ellen? Aye. Yes. Burial? Yes. Castro? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Ross? Yes. Yellow? Yes. Haven? Yes. Oshay? Yes. Ishmael? Yes. Kenny? Yes. Cesar? Abstain. Leonard? Abstain. Leonard? Abstain. Lewis? Yes. Martin? Yes. Molina? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Sheffo? Yes. Silva? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sir? Yes. Swift? Yes. Yes. Motion uh, passes. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a need for executive session today. So may I have a motion and a second to go into executive session to discuss settlement of claims. Uh, so moved by Dr. Silva, second by Ms. Barrero. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Ayes have it.